So 1800 is about where we end up with uh, for Abraham. So where I tend to diverge, it's not just me. I mean, I'm not the only one that, that thinks this way. But um, one of the, in fact, I even heard pastors say it um, this last week at our church. Uh, it's just so, it's so ingrained in people's thought uh, is the idea that the Israelites uh, were slaves for 430 years. Right, uh, or even if you just took the 400-year timeline, this is really ingrained in people's mindset that the Israelites were slaves for 400 and something years. A um, couple of problems with that. One, Paul tells us that the 400 years was from the time God spoke the promise to Abraham to the time that God took the Israelites out of that. So Paul clearly says that. that to me, that's definitive, but we'll go into more detail. But that's the, the most definitive part is that in the New Testament, Paul says that the timeline started. He says, we know that they were in, uh, that it was 430 years from the time that God spoke the promise to Abraham to the time that they left Egypt, right? So we're talking the 430 years is from when God gave them the promise which dates back to Abraham's life, which includes Abraham's life, Isaac's life, Jacob's life, Joseph's life, and then the slavery, right? Okay, so that's the first key part. Second key part is because tradition is so strong on this line, um, we would like to think that all of our Bible interpreters are just interpreting it exactly how they find it, but anytime that there's an issue, um, they have to do their best. They're just people. They have to do their best to try and come up with what is the accurate interpretation because none of our Bible books were written in English, right? So we're many uh, generations away, uh, many languages away from the Bible, right? They were written in uh, Hebrew. Uh, and then a derivative of Hebrew is called Aramaic. That was uh, becoming very popular during the time of the disciples. Um, in fact, Daniel, portions of Daniel are written in Aramaic, and he was one of the later books written. Uh, and then we have the emergence of the Greek language, um, where many of our New Testament books were written in Greek. It had become the world language. I think that's always kind of neat to think that um, Alexander the Great had expanded the influence of Greece so much prior to the Roman Empire, which was, which was just an offshoot of the Greek Empire. Um, he's one of the, the Greek generals when Alexander the Great died. Uh, he divided up his land, and Rome was one of the, the nations that emerged after he died um, at about 36 years old. He died really young, and his land was split up, and Rome was one of the four um, regions that emerged after Alexander the Great died. So um, the Roman influence was really just on the coattails of the Greek influence, which was um, in many ways more broad spread even than the Roman one was because um, it went down into Egypt and to other areas that Alexander the Great had conquered. So, um, it's kind of neat that the whole world then spoke Greek. And it made it very easy for the disciples to fulfill what Jesus commanded them to do, which is go into all the world and preach the gospel, because almost everybody spoke Greek. You know, today, if you were to go into many other places um, uh, and you spoke Greek, uh, probably nobody would be able to understand what you're saying in almost every place that you went. But because God had... Um, allowed most of the world to speak Greek, uh, the disciples were able to go to any nation just about and were able to preach the gospel in those early years because of the common language. So, um, getting back to this 430 years and the importance of that. Speaking of translation, that's where I was going. We, we have our Bible translators are doing the best that they can, but in every once in a while, there is a place that I think they could have done it a little differently, right? This is one of them. In Exodus, it says, the actual Hebrew that's in there says that they were sojourners and slaves for 400 years. But when they're translating this, as everybody knows, they were slaves for 430 years. That's what they think. You know, that's the tradition, right? Is that they were slaves for 400 years. It's, it's so permeated... Uh, even our biblical scholars' mind, that they were actually slaves for that full time, that they thought, oh, this must be an addition. So in trying to keep it pure, they don't put this word in any of our English translations of that passage in Exodus where it talks about how long they were in there, right? But if you go back and look at the Hebrew part that they made our English Bible out of, it's there. But they feel like 
it gives a, a misunderstanding because they think they were enslaved for 430 years, so they don't put it in. But in actual fact, they've created the misunderstanding by not putting it there. Because God was telling Abraham that you will be sojourners. This was, because remember when God gave the promise, that's what he said. He said, you will be sojourners and slaves. So in Exodus, when it says they came out, it's basically reaffirming word for word what God had said to Abraham, that they were sojourners and slaves for this amount of time, right? So when God gives the promise, he says, you will be sojourners and you will be slaves for 400 and something years. Uh, and so I think this is a big part of why our dates don't seem to line up as well as they should. Let me give you a few more uh, facts to throw out there. In, in Exodus, it gives the genealogy of Moses. This may surprise you. Um, if I told you that Moses was Jacob's grandson, uh, would that surprise you? If I told you that on the other side he was Jacob's great-grandson, uh, would that surprise you? Um, if you're looking at for 430 years between them, that would be very surprising. The research that I would push puts their time in Egypt at 220 years, their slavery, these are approximations at about 130 years. Which given people living, Jacob lived to be 130 ish, I think 134, 135. Uh, Joshua, uh, Joseph lived to be 110. Moses lived to be 120. So with slightly longer lifespans than we have now, this, uh, and Moses was born in the middle of this, right? So Moses was born uh, 80 years um, into this slavery period because 40 years he grew up they were slaves while he grew up in Pharaoh's house. And then 40 years they were slaves while he was in the wilderness. Um, so 80 years of this time period, uh, you have to go back to when Moses was born. So Moses was born only about 50 years or so into uh, their time of slavery, uh, which fits perfectly with the, his genealogy. It's, it's right there in Exodus. It gives the genealogy that Moses, um, both of his parents come through, obviously, through Jacob's line. Um, but he is the great-grandson of Jacob's. So it's very close um, in time period. This doesn't fit at all. Um, and then and we know from what Paul said that that is, that is a misunderstanding of that 430 years. But it is kind of interesting. I want to say it's, it's Exodus 6, um, but it's right there in the beginning. It gives Moses his genealogy, and, and he is um, just the great-grandson of Jacob. Right? Clayton, that, that's never like... Well, the reason that they don't do it is because they're so fixed on this having to be true that they assume that there must be stuff left out of Moses' genealogy because how could he be his great-grandson? Uh, because it's 430 years. There's no way he could be his great-grandson with 430 years passing through. And so they just assume that the Bible has left out names out of the genealogy, and so they don't ever bring it up. But if you take the Bible for what it says, that Moses was Jacob's great-grandson, then this is much more accurate. And in fact, in the Exodus class, there's other things that we have that prove this, uh, and that uh, we're only talking about a couple of generations of pharaohs that had them in slavery. So what we have here is uh, the difference here of this 90 years is the life of, of Joseph and a few years after Joseph's life. So they were in Egypt for nearly 100 years and not slaves. In fact, they were the head and not the tail. They were the only people in the entire world that they knew who weren't slaves, in fact. I don't know if you know that, but um, when Joseph rose to power, the Bible says that as part of Joseph's plan, everyone was drawn uh, in to get their grain, and all of them were sold into slavery except for the Hebrews, right? And so everyone in Egypt was a slave during the time of Joseph because they didn't have any money. And so the Bible says when they came down to it, they had sold their land, they sold their stuff. All the way down to the end in those last couple of years, they presented themselves. And the Bible says that all of Egypt then was a slave to Pharaoh except for the Hebrews. They were the only free people. And, and, and Pharaoh's priests um, that were closest to him in his home. He let them be free as well because they had their food from Pharaoh. And so they didn't need to, to sell anything uh, to get food. They were part of Pharaoh's house. But everyone that wasn't part of Pharaoh's house or that wasn't a Hebrew in the whole world back then was a slave. Ezekiel tells us that the Israelites, after the time of Joseph's death, fell into idolatry. And the Bible says then that God, um, to judge them for their idolatry, switched it. Right? 
and all of Egypt was free, and all of Israel became slaves, right, as God's form of judgment over their idolatry, that they had fallen into the Egyptian gods, they were no longer serving the Lord, and God instantly... Um, With this man, um, which in Exodus, I will show you this more clearly, we have records from him where his general says that Sostris too was pleased with him because he fulfilled his mission of putting into slavery very quickly all of the Asiatics who lived in their realm. Asiatics was their word for someone from the Promised Land. There was no nation of Israel at the time. Um, and that's why you don't find references to Israel's slavery anywhere in Egypt because there was no Israel. But if you understand that they called them Asiatics instead of Israelites, and you go and look for an Asiatic slavery in that same area, you find it. And there was. Um, but they, just, they don't call them Israelites. They call them Asiatics because they came from what they called Asia was the promised land. So anyone from the promised land um, was called an Asiatic to an Egyptian. Uh, and so if you look for Asiatic slavery in Egypt, you find it, and it's there. Uh, and it's there all the way through. There's lots of Asiatic slavery. But under this man, uh, and in the Exodus class, I can show you all of his fathers and his sons and how perfectly they fit into everything that the Bible says. Uh, and in fact, I even have uh, pictures of a statue from one of his great-grandfathers. And his vizier um, is in that statue. And his vizier, which was the vice president, which is the, which is the thing that Joseph held, during his lifetime, this one of his great-grandfathers, who lived during the time of Joseph, according to my dates here, and not just me, uh, this is more in line with, a, with an informed Christian perspective. It's not just depending on, you know, kind of the world for our dates. In Joseph's time frame, the vizier there was renowned because he created all of these granaries in Egypt, and the pharaoh that he served exploded. They call it the golden years of Egypt. If so, if, I've read a lot of Egyptian books that, that are not Christian, but they call this period the golden time period of Egypt. Um, and it is the time when Egypt exploded. Egypt was split um, prior to the, the person right before Joseph. So the pharaoh that Joseph worked for, his dad unified in many ways northern and southern Egypt, and then it exploded in growth. They call it the golden years. Um, and part of the golden years was that they increased in wealth so much in such a short period of time, and they have a hard time explaining exactly why, Egyptian scholars, but they know that during uh, Sostris I, is his name, that during his life, Egypt exploded in such an amazing way, and part of it was because they did two things. One, we have hieroglyphics that show that they put granaries all over Egypt um, to collect a tax on grain, which is exactly what Joseph did. And the other neat thing is that his vizier, which is the vice president, which is what Joseph's position was, it was a formal position in Egypt. So Joseph was not the only one to ever fulfill that. That was a formal position um, that they had, and Joseph stepped into. Joseph was promoted to something that was um, a well-known position, that Pharaoh would always have a vizier, which was in charge of everything except for Pharaoh. This vizier in the city of Hylopolis, in an area known as the Phaeum, it's, a, it's still there today, created a man-made lake um, that was huge in order to protect the Egyptians during a time of famine because he knew if famine was coming, um, it would mean they ran out of water. And so he didn't just collect grain, he also collected water. And in order to do that, the only source of water that they had was the Nile River. So they created, it was one of the wonders of the ancient world, they created like a 250-mile man-made river from the Nile to this man-made lake that's huge. You can see it on a map. This, this lake that they made is so big, it's still on the map as a blue dot right in the middle of Egypt. But it's man-made. And do you know what they call that man-made lake? Even today, like if you go to Egypt today, this man-made river that was made during the time of Seostris I, which is what I believe um, I could prove is Joseph's Pharaoh. Do you know what they call it even today? It's called the Yotef Canal, which is an Egyptian form of Joseph, even today. And it's a man-made lake. So in other words, what Joseph did was he knew, and this, by the way, where this lake went to is Hyopolis, um, was right there. And that is where the Bible says that when Joseph was doing all this, he met a woman 
in Hyalopolis and married her. And that's where Ephraim and Manasseh came from. And this is where the Yotef Canal went to, was right there in the city where jo it says that Joseph was living and met the priestess um, and married. And so it's kind of an interesting thing. The reason I say all of this is because not many people have made these connections, not because it's not there. Many people tell you that this, that this information is not there and that there's no connections between Egypt and the biblical story and that it's all lost, but it's not lost. It's all there. They're just looking two to three hundred years too late because they've made some basic fundamental mistakes in reading the scripture. And so uh, that's, that's one mistake. What time is it? Is that? Okay, so we still got some time. All right. When we do an Exodus class, we can break this down even more. But this is a good introduction so that you understand why the timeline is so important. Because if you get the timeline right, then not only does the Bible not produce no connections, it produces all kinds of connections, right? And so um, this also connects with why... Um, I can set it off if you want. Where's my hammer? <laughs> yeah, let me. Uh, uh, I'm pressing the off button, but it isn't. Oh my gosh. And. Um, Sorry. All right, so where was I on my timeline? No, I'm just kidding. All right, so one other thing that this kind of fits with th there's a lot of stuff where people have just written off the Bible as, as actual history because they have this timeline wrong, right? Let me give you another example. Kathleen Kenyon was an archaeologist, and she was the one that excavated. Um, Jericho, right? And so when she excavated, it's so ridiculous, her finding was that it was destroyed how the Bible said, but the Bible was wrong because it actually happened two or three hundred years before when the Bible said it does, because she's going, she, her timeline is off by three hundred years, So she, because she's going by these same inaccurate timelines, and so she says, oh yeah, it happened how the Bible said it did, but it was two to three hundred years before Joshua would have got there. So Joshua must have just taken a story from somebody else. From a, So when Joshua got there, the place was already destroyed because it happened two or three hundred years earlier. Well, if you correct for the fact that they weren't slaves for 430 years, they were slaves for 130 years, then all of a sudden it draws all that timeline back about two or three hundred years, and then all of a sudden Joshua's entrance into Jericho is the exact year that the Bible said it was, and it happened every way that he did. And so there's all kinds of history books now that are written that say that Joshua showed up to Jericho, and it was already destroyed two to three hundred years earlier. And so they adopted the story of the destruction as their own uh, because the place was already destroyed. That's in all kinds of history books. But if you get the timeline right, then all of a sudden that 300 years before falls on the same year that the Bible said Joshua showed up there, and then all of a sudden you've got to deal with the fact that Jericho was destroyed exactly the way that the Bible said in exactly the year that Joshua was there. And that's a whole different picture than, oh, Joshua just showed up to a place that had been destroyed 300 years earlier, right? And so there's a lot of, of scholars out there who are taking this stuff as, as the truth, and so... It, there is no, in, in a lot of academics, there's no real uh, appreciation for the history and the genuineness of the Bible in non-Christian scholars. And a lot of it is these very basic mistakes that unfortunately many of our own um, perpetuate even within the church that, you know, they were slaves for 430 years. And, and so it's not that nobody's doing it in the church probably maliciously. It's just some mistakes that have slipped in. Uh, that we kind of perpetuate, right? Uh, that a more accurate reading of the Bible helps us to, to hone in on those a little closer. So let me give you the rest of these timelines real quick. Um, we have uh, Late Bronze, uh, which is 1550 to 1200. Okay, so Late Bronze. So this goes from Abraham to uh, the date of the Exodus would be 1446. Okay. That we know from the Bible. The trouble is, um, what we call 1446 and what non-Christian scholars call 1446 is something totally different. We'll go over that in the Exodus class. The Bible gives us this date because it says how many years from the time that Solomon created um, the temple to the Exodus. It tells us how many years it is. So we know this is the date. There's this discrepancy, um, like I said, with the timeline about when this actually falls. Right. So we can get in to that in the Exodus class. But so that's the date of the Exodus. So late bronze, 1550 to 1200, 
takes us from the Exodus and part of the slavery in the Exodus into the taking of the promised land, right, and the period of the judges, right? Okay. Then it gets into Iron Age. Iron Age uh, was an interesting time. Uh, iron was the stealth technology of the day. If you remember, the Bible says that Israel had no one that knew how to do iron. And so they were at a disadvantage. They had to go to the Philistines uh, in order to get any iron. Right? And so the Philistines had lots of iron, and they wouldn't share the technology. They would sell you some iron sometimes to make money, but they, were, they forbid people to teach Israelites how to do iron because then their nation would uh, have access to those kind of weapons. They used it to make their chariots. Their swords were stronger. So if you took an iron sword and hit it against the bronze sword, the iron sword will win. Right? Bronze weapons will crack under iron. And so this was a major technological advantage. This is why the Israelites struggled quite a bit during the time of the judges. Even though Israel won several battles, if you look at most of their battles, it was all miraculous things. It wasn't like Israel just, you know, uh, won a battle because they were a superior foe. It was things like Gideon where God allowed them to win uh, by his grace, right? It was really God uh, defeated these people on behalf of the Israelites. They never were the dominant force in their region prior to David. At any point, they were never militarily superior to anyone in their region except for when David comes around. Right? So during all of Iron Age 1, uh, which David comes in right at 1,000 here. Right? So right around 1,000, this is time, I think David was at 1,000. Right? And then uh, down into, uh, I, I want to say 946, uh, something right in there is when Solomon made the temple. So David and Solomon are from 1,000 through 900. Right? Interestingly enough, anybody remember when Israel was destroyed? It's, it's, it was several battles, right? So the northern ten tribes crossing from about 722 to 714, right? So if David and Solomon are 1,000 through 900, and the Israelites were wiped out in the 700s, they only made it a couple hundred years, you know, before those northern It's not a real long time because there were several kings, and it's, it takes a long time to read through the book of Kings, and you see all these different kings in there. Sometimes we get the, the feeling that this was a long time. It's basically, they, they were in existence, these northern ten tribes, um, you know, after they split, uh, about the time from the Civil War to now. So, I mean, we're not talking about a really long stretch of being a nation. Uh, you know, about 200 years or so. Um, and God wiped them out, allowed them to be wiped out by Assyria. All right, Iron Age 2. is a uh, thousand through about 586 for our purposes um, this is the destruction of the temple right uh, so this is iron age 2 um, anything before early bronze in academic literature uh, you may think what might be before bronze age you probably kick yourself. Stone Age, yeah. So when they talk about Stone Age, that's what they're talking about. It's, it's a literal time period. Now, within the Stone Age, they have it broken up um, across all kinds of, of different periods in the Stone Age. The one that, um, the, the only one that I think is really accurate. So they, when they, when they get past the first period that goes, uh, interestingly enough, uh, about 7,000 BC um, to this time period, is the only one that really has any interest. To me, because I know the Bible says that it didn't go anywhere, actually even before 6,000 B.C., you know, through this time period, there wasn't anything. In fact, it only goes to about 4,000 B.C., according to the Bible. But this period that they're saying 7,000 B.C. up to early bronze is called Neolithic. Everything before that is when they start talking about, you know, evolution and coming from Neanderthals and all that kind of stuff. And, which, if you don't know, there is no Neanderthal, and there never was any Neanderthal, and they've never found a Neanderthal. And a lot of that stuff, a lot of that stuff is, it's ridiculous to the stuff that they have done. One of their Neanderthals was the body of a young uh, child, and it was found, the upper part of the body was found in a burial, and they found 200 feet deeper and seven miles away, mind you, some bow-legged legs, which eventually we came to find out was from somebody that had a vitamin D deficiency. And they put those two together into one skeleton and say they're not sure how they got separated so far, but this is the Neanderthal 
And they pushed that for years, and people didn't know how ridiculous the story of that thing was. Um, and you say, well, why would they do that? <coughs> because when your job is an archaeologist, you, can't, you don't get a paycheck week to week. The only way that you get paid is if somebody thinks you find something interesting. And so otherwise, if you don't find anything interesting, nobody's going to give to your dig. And so there's all kinds of issues of things that are just ridiculous finds that people put together because they know if they can't show something interesting, then they starve or have to go back and they can't be an archaeologist and they come back to the States. And so there's all kinds of stories of people coming up with things that are very questionable, particularly associated with a lot of the dinosaur findings and a lot of these Neanderthal findings that are very questionable in their accuracy because if you can't show some kind of finding that's interesting, uh, then you get shut down, right? And so there's a lot of pressure to find something, right? Um, so these Neanderthals uh, are not true, right? Uh, so Neolithic is the only one for our purposes uh, that I want you to know about. All the other stuff prior to that is all just uh, imagination, right? Um, so these are time periods that I want you to remember. So when we get on to the final, um, I, wa I want you to remember these and the date. And so I'll, we'll go back over that when we get closer to the final, but that, that will definitely be a question on there. Just because you read this so much, and when somebody says, oh, this is Iron Age 1 or Early Bronze, they don't take the time to tell you what year that is. Um, it's almost like if somebody said uh, it happened during the Civil War period, they assume you know that's 1850s, 1860s. They may not spell that out for you when they're writing the article. And so with your biblical reading, you'll run into, in your studies, a lot of people that just reference these. Um, and so it's important to kind of get your, your bearings straight when you read your, your stuff. If somebody says Iron Age, you need to know that's, that's David, that's Judges, you know, that's uh, the King's period, that kind of stuff. So that helps us to bridge the gap between what secular archaeologists have as their timeline and how that <coughs> impacts biblical stories, right? So this is not necessarily a biblical uh, breakdown. This is a secular archaeologist breakdown, and so we want to know how that cross-references into our stories that we know in the Bible. So when somebody says Iron Age was like this, then you know, okay, they're talking about the time of David, right?